Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. It is such a pleasure and a privilege and really an honor to be here with you. I've only been in this new role at the Lutheran Seminary for a couple of months, and one of the things I have learned for sure is that the relationships and the ties and the roots between Grace Practice at Germantown and Lutheran Seminary in Philadelphia are deep and strong, and for that I am so very grateful. Between Dr. Robinson and Dr. Jones, of course, the roles he's played and Dr. Wright, we have a goodly heritage for which I am so very thankful. I taught preaching for a number of years at some uh, different seminaries, most recently at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, and at one time or another I would always have a question, particularly from students early in the work who encouraged after they preached just a couple sermons and they'd say, Professor, will this ever get easier? Will I ever be less nervous? And I'd tell them, no. <laughs> I've been preaching for who knows how long, and I'm always nervous, never more so than in preaching in a place like this with the strong tradition of preaching you've enjoyed. But I do take some comfort from where the sermon falls in the service, because no matter what happens in the next few minutes, between the two choirs, you have already heard the word. <laughs> Love to hear 
stories, stories about when they were littler than they were, the still silly things they did, the silly things their friends and family did. They loved to hear stories about the silly things their parents did when we were little. One of their favorites that I
into our basement, and the one corner of our basement that had no windows to wait out a tornado. And we had the television on in a room nearby so we could listen to the forecast as the newscasters were talking about the path of this tornado. And as we were waiting and tense, one of the kids says, Daddy, tell us the story about Grandpa and Flood. Because it wasn't then about knowing the Grandpa that it was about hope. It was a story that reminded them that we'll be okay. It was a story of providence. Care, God's promise to deliver God's people. Stories mean so very much to us. They connect us to each other. They give us hope. They give us faith. Yeah. Now I know that although we all love a good story, we have different criteria, different standards for assessing stories. Some people most like dramatic stories. Others want romantic stories. Others only want true stories or stories that we are told at least are based on a true story. And so we'll watch those commercials tonight and we'll assess them differently, what becomes our favorite, because we have different standards. Now, according to my wife, there's only one standard that matters when it comes to a story. It's just, it, for her, that means the story had a good ending. And by good, I should tell you, she needs to happy. <laughs> she feels like there's enough heartache in this world. Of challenge of struggle, and when she reads a story or watches a story, she wants something to end well. And when the story doesn't, she's been known to rewrite the ending in her own head. <laughs> so should you meet my wife someday, don't ever mention what actually happens to Bambi's mother. <laughs> she just will not want to know. And in her mind, they're all probably happily ever after. She wants a happy ending, which means which means she probably wouldn't like the ending to Mark's gospel that we just heard very much. This is not a typical happy ending. In fact, this ending of Mark's gospel has been giving Christians, good Christians, fits for centuries. It has upset them and challenged them and push them at times to rewrite the ending to make it a little better. See, this is Mark's account of the resurrection of our Lord. It is the resurrection story, but there are two huge problems with this story that have vexed Christians throughout the millennia. One is, it's a story of the resurrection of Jesus, but oddly, ironically, almost embarrassingly, there's one character who's missing from Mark's story of the resurrection of Jesus. Do you know who that is? It's Jesus. <laughs> it's the resurrection story of Jesus. We know Jesus. That's a problem. Second problem is that you have these women, disciples. The women are the only one who have stayed with Jesus through the end. Peter denied. Judas betrayed, the rest deserted, but the women have hung in there. They've been watching from afar, and now, three days later, they come to give their last rights, to do their last honor to their Lord and Savior. They're worried about who will open that big stone, how will they perform the task that they want to perform. They hadn't thought about that, and they get there and worry and wonder, and all of a sudden the stone is gone. And they walk in, and they see their young man, wearing all white, and they are alarmed. And the angel greets them with the signature words of good news throughout Scripture, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, and then gives them the best news they could have imagined. Jesus of Nazareth, the one who died, the one you're looking for, is not a human. Go, tell the disciples, tell even me. He will meet you there ahead, just as he promised. So when we get there and they hear the good news that God keeps God's promises. And then they're given instructions, simple and clear. Go and tell. Go and tell. Peter and the disciples. 
has troubled Christians for centuries because here it is, good news. And in case they might have missed it, the angel began with those signature words, the signal, do not be afraid. In fact, every time in Scripture where those priest or prophet, if you hear the words, if you hear someone start a speech by saying, do not be afraid, you know what will come is gospel, good news. Now, on the other hand, if you hear anyone begin a speech by saying, woe to you, <laughs> you can start coming out now. Because there are these signals in Scripture. Woe unto you, bad news. Do not be afraid, good news. So they get the signal, they hear the news better than they ever could have expected. They're given clear, succinct directions. Go and tell the disciples and Peter. And then you hear Mark say these words. But trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb, and they said nothing. Thank you. 
better because, because truth be told, when you read Mark's gospel, you realize he's not that good at the beginning either. Now, the beginnings of stories are always important. Those opening lines create for us a sense of mood, a sense of tenor and tone. And authors will sometimes spend countless hours trying to craft the perfect opening line. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. That's something that stays with you. Call me a shame. In the beginning. Those are lines we remember. And so each of the Gospels have particularly interesting, significant openings. Matthew's Gospel opens with a genealogy. Tells the entire descent, ancestry of Jesus all the way back to Abraham. Because Matthew wants us to know that Jesus comes from the family of Abraham through the line of David and will be the one that redeems his Luke begins his story with that gorgeous, beautiful story of Mary. You can read it by the angel. Going with Joseph to Bethlehem, there delivered her firstborn, who's wrapped in swaddling clothes, being surrounded by shepherds and by angels. It's a gorgeous story, one we rehearse each and every Christmas. John, not to be outdone, begins with those signature words in the beginning. Because John believes he's telling about Jesus. John is telling about the new beginning, the new creation of God and Jesus. And then goes on in the first 18 verses to sing a hymn to the Word, the Word that was with God and was God, the Word that became flesh for us, Jesus the Christ. So Matthew starts with the genealogy. Luke starts with the tender story of Mary and the baby. John offers us this profound hymn to the word. Do you remember how Mark starts? With one sentence. This is the good news of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. Period. That's it. Then he goes on to talk about John the Baptist. This is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Period. I mean, real work. I mean, that's better than that. <laughs> so there's where I was. I was just thinking, okay, Mark's great at telling a fast-paced story, but he's not that good at beginning them, he's not that good at ending them. And then someone told me, I don't remember who or where I read it, or someone told me, I'm pretty sure, though, I wasn't smart enough to figure it out for myself. That's why we come here in the community, because people can offer us different things. Someone pointed out to me that we really shouldn't be surprised by the failure of these women disciples at the end of the gospel. Because that only fulfills a pattern that has been running throughout all of Mark's gospel. The pattern has two parts. It goes like this. Throughout Mark's gospel, the people who should know who Jesus is don't. The people who should recognize Jesus as the Son of God regularly stumble and fall. They do not tell the way they should. And so when you're leading up to the crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus predicts his death and resurrection three different times in Mark's gospel. Right? You wonder how they can be surprised. <laughs> three different times Jesus tells his disciples that he will be taken to Jerusalem, handed over, crucified, and on the third day rise again. Do you know what the typical response of the disciples is after Jesus' prediction? <laughs> they don't get it. They don't understand. Sometimes they argue with Jesus. Remember, that's what Peter does. Mark tells us Peter actually rebuked his Lord when Jesus made that prediction. The second time Jesus makes predictions even worse. It's almost like they're not listening. They go for a walk after that prediction, and the guys start, the disciples start arguing with Jesus. What are you arguing about? And I think he's wondering, are you arguing about who will defend me? About who will go with me to the end? About who will hold on to me through the hardest times? No, they were arguing about who will be the greatest. It's like they didn't even hear. That's a part, the first part of a pattern that runs throughout Mark's gospel. The people who should know who Jesus is don't. Now the other part of the pattern is that there are people who do know who Jesus is recognize him as the Son of God, but that we cannot count on them to testify. The very first scene in Mark's Gospel is Jesus preaching and teaching in the synagogue, and while he's there, there is a man with an unclean spirit, and that unclean spirit recognizes Jesus straight away. What do you have to do with us, Jesus, Son of God? He cries out. The 
asks the, the Gerizim man who's possessed by a demon, and the demon again screams out, What do you want from us, Jesus, Son of the Most High? The demons recognize who Jesus is. They see it, but the problem is, can you count on a demon for a testimony? No, you cannot. No, you cannot. They know, but they won't tell. There's one other character in the Gospel story that knows who Jesus is. It's right at the end. It's another unlikely character. It is the Roman centurion. The Roman centurion at the cross who puts Jesus to death. And the moment of Jesus dying, the Roman centurion sees. And he understands. And he says, truly, this man was the Son of God. The centurion, this Roman, who crucified Jesus, knows and sees who Jesus is. And we have a Roman centurion for testimony. So that's the twofold pattern that runs throughout Mark's gospel. The people who know who, who the, the people who should know who Jesus is don't. And the people who do know will not tell. And so here we have the end, another example of women and disciples who should know who Jesus is. But don't. And so they leave terrified and say nothing. So 
here it is. Here it is. Just a question. Where does the Bible begin? It's not a trick question. Where does the Bible begin? In the beginning. That's absolutely right. That's what Genesis means. In the beginning. The Bible begins in the beginning. Can you remember where it ends? At the very end. Isn't that awesome? The Bible begins in the beginning and ends at the end. Okay, you're just like everybody else. <laughs> No, what I love about that is here we have this, this huge story of God and the people of God that begins all the way at the very beginning of time and ends all the way at the end of history, which means when you think about it, that you and I, that we live somewhere in the middle. That we live somewhere between the Acts of the Apostles and Revelation. That we find ourselves smack dab in the middle of this ongoing story of God and love for the world. And it's our time to pick up the part. It's our time to see ourselves as the new actors in the story. The ones commissioned to live it and to share it until all have heard of the love of Jesus. And that story has never been needed more. When I look around at the problems in our world, our nation, Communities or accomplices. I think of every one of them as someone who believed in that story. Someone who bought into a deficient story. So a young man is struggling with whether or not to join a gang and does because he bought into the wrong story. When a young woman is going to give herself over to a man that she does not love but wants his affirmation, she's bought into a wrong story. When our elders can't imagine anything beyond their work or their home life when they see no hope they have bought into the wrong story and we have a better one but truth be told there are so many stories today behind each of those commercials we watch is a story and while some of them may inspire us for a moment most of them are designed for one thing only to make us spend <laughs> to make us feel like the right way make us feel like we do not have enough so that we'll buy some things. They are not life-giving stories. There are so many stories in the world that would lead us astray. They remind us, when I think about it that way, of a number of stories out there that want to lead us astray, that, that see us only as consumers, that want to pit us against each other. When I think of stories that way, the stories of our culture, it reminds me it reminds me of the Greek story, the Greek myth of the sirens. Do you remember that story? It was the women who were uh, had these beautiful voices and could fly, and they'd fly out to sailor ships, and they would sing a song more beautiful than the sailors had ever heard. And the sailors, entranced by that story, would then follow the harpies back to their island, surrounded by shoals, by rocks, and their ships would founder on those rocks, and the sailors would that's the Cyrus song. And so many of the stories our culture would tell us are Cyrus songs, leading us not to life in the Lord, but to death. Now there are, there are two places in Greek mythology where the Sirens figure largely. One is the story of Odysseus, who coming back from the Trojan War with the sailors, embarks on this multi-year odyssey. And at one point, he comes near the island of the sirens, and he's been warned. He knows of the power of their voices, but he wants to hear it. And so he first stuffs all of his men's ears with beeswax. All the sailors, their ears are stopped shut so they can't hear. And then he has them lashed into the mast so that when he hears the siren song, he can't try to move the ship or dive overboard, and they sail through. That's one story, and I think one way we at times have tried to resist the siren songs of our culture. We could just Stuff our kids' ears shut. Keep them from TV. Make sure they're in Sunday school. We'll protect them. But sooner or later, you know what they go off. They go off. They go off. They have to fend with all those siren songs on their own. There's another story, though, not nearly as well known. It's the story of Jason and the Argonauts, who launched a voyage to find the Golden Fleece. It was a mantle that we put it on anyone and healed them of all disease. And just before Jason's going to launch, the Oracle of Delphi tells Jason to take along Orpheus. Now, Orpheus is a musician. 
So he brings Orpheus along, and eventually Jason and the Argonauts also find their way near the sirens. And they come out, and they sing, and the sailors are transfixed, and they begin to follow the sirens to their sure death. And at that moment, the purpose of Orpheus is revealed. Orpheus pulls out his lyre, and he goes to the prow of the ship. Yeah. 